Welcome to St. Andrew's Episcopal Church online. Uh, as vicar of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, I speak on behalf of our community that we acknowledge the traditional peoples of the land on which we now worship, even while we are socially distant, especially the Pasquayaki and Tohono O'odham nations. We pay our respects to them for their care of the land. Thank you for joining us this morning in this a uh, strange way to do church, a uh, strange but I hope still meaningful and still spirit-filled. Um, we're so grateful for your presence, and um, we're glad that we're able to join with you even virtually. Um, we'll continue to worship this way for the near future. Uh, hopefully soon we may be able to return to streaming the services from the church, um, but even in that case we'll still have to uh, keep the building closed uh, to the congregation. So look for uh, more updates on that in the future. But for now, I just want to say that it is a joy once again to be with you all, even though I can't see many of you, um, and to be sharing this, the day the, that God has made uh, with you. So we'll begin our worship with the Liturgy of the Word. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy milk and wine, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Here ends the reading. Your kingdom, O Lord, is an everlasting kingdom. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone and his compassion is over all his works. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord. and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the needs of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. and loving in all his works. The Lord is near to those who call upon him. To all who call upon him faithfully, he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and helps them. The Lord preserves all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. 
Your kingdom, O Lord, is an everlasting kingdom. A reading from Romans. I am, not spe I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. 
When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces 12 baskets full and those who ate were about about 5000 men besides women and children the gospel of our lord praise to you Lord Christ. Isaiah asks, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? I think this is a powerful question, a question that cuts right to the heart of our values. What do we spend our money, our labor on? Because of course, the double question coming as it does in the midst of Hebrew poetry is what is sometimes called a thought rhyme. The second phrase is meant to restate the first in a different way, a way that sheds new light on the first. And in this case, we move from the specific and concrete to the general and abstract. Why do you spend your money on what is not bread? Which is a quite specific question. And then it is explained with, why do you spend your labor on that which does not satisfy? Bread here then is a symbol for that which satisfies. It, ideas, it, it echoes the idea of thirst, the idea that I, Isaiah began with. Um, that thirst being satisfied with water and milk and wine. And then we have bread satisfying what we hunger for. So these are concrete examples of a more general pairing, what we long for and what will satisfy that longing. Money by the same token is a symbol, a concrete example of something that represents a more general concept our labors, our efforts, what we expend energy on. So the whole question is meant to evoke this problem. We pass through this life filled with a great longing, a great thirst, a great hunger. Presumably there is something that will satisfy this longing. Why then do we expend all our efforts acquiring things that do not, in fact, satisfy it. To answer this question, we have to understand what money is, how it works, and how it creates this very problem. Now, this is a sermon, not a class on economics. So I'm not going to try to explain money very thoroughly. Instead, I want to start with this short reflection from the Episcopal priest turned philosopher, Alan Watts. He says this, I think one of the very best illustrations of the difference between symbol and reality 
is the difference between money and wealth. And a lot of people don't know the difference. Nowadays, we are all accustomed to shopping in a supermarket. And when we go there, we get a great cart full of produce and groceries and liquor and what have you. You take it to the cashier's gangway place, you know, and she taps away on her machine and she produces an enormously long strip of paper and tears it off and says, $30, please. And most people at that moment feel slightly depressed because they had to get rid of $30. And that's a very strange and odd reaction because you got rid of paper. And in exchange for this paper, you got wealth, real edible food, usable things, riches. And you should go home in a very happy mood that you got this great bundle of stuff. But somehow, the loss of money hurts us a little bit. Watts is pointing to the same problem Isaiah is. It's a problem of confusing a symbol with reality, of failing to see that the money is not real, that it is just a symbol that represents something else, something we have already exchanged for money. It may be labor, it may be another real resource we had. Maybe we sold something valuable. But what is happening in that exchange in the supermarket is in fact a trade. We have traded something of value, like our labor, for something else of value, like food. The money is just a convenient way of making that trade easier. To understand this, we just have to imagine a world without money. And such a world may seem almost unthinkable to us now, but it is in fact only as far away for each of us as our own childhood. Remember that you had to learn at some point as a child how money works. When I was a little boy, everyone wrote checks for everything. Credit cards weren't as popular as they are now. And there was no Apple Pay or Pay with your phone or anything like that, obviously. And I remember I would ask my parents for something in the store and they would say, we don't have enough money. And I would say, what do you mean? I saw your checkbook yesterday and it was full of checks. Why don't you just write another check? I had to learn, you see, how the whole system works to understand why this solution was impossible. So money is a symbolic system. There's nothing natural or inherent about it. It's something we have to learn. And it's something that had to be invented. At first, when people needed something they didn't have, they would exchange something else for it. That was a barter economy. But then people discovered that it was tricky to always have something someone else wanted. If you had chickens and needed wheat, you might not find anyone else who had wheat and wanted chickens. So, were always valuable. Precious metals, sure, but other cultures have used other things. Cowrie shells, beads, cocoa beans, tobacco leaves have all been used to name just a few. Some of the first Anglican priests in America were sometimes paid by their vestries with tobacco, in fact. But eventually the idea comes along of standardizing the thing used for exchange so that people can trust that the thing they are receiving for their trade will have the same value when they need to trade it, when they need to trade it for something else. And so this trading will be quite simple. Now, why am I belaboring this point about what money is? Two reasons. The first is to explore how the invention of money affects the way we see the world. The whole idea of money 
is that it is exchanged for something valuable. So on one side, we might see it as substituting for value. And we begin to believe that it has value in its own right. That's how we usually treat it. On the flip side, though, it also substitutes for need. Let me explain. Say I take some chickens to the market and I'm looking for grain. What I'm actually looking for is someone who has more grain than he needs, but needs more chickens. Now, I can't find someone like that, so I'm out of luck. No one needs chickens that has grain. Now, let's add money into the mix. Now, I need grain, and I have too many chickens, and someone else has too much grain, and another person has too much to, uh, someone else, that is, needs chickens. I no longer need those to be the same person. I can take my chickens to the person who needs them and ask for money. And then I can take my money to the person who has too much grain and exchange it. Now, why does the person with too much grain accept money for it? Because he anticipates a time when he will need something. And he knows that the money will enable him to acquire it. Money, in other words, is a way of storing value, but it is also a way of storing need. The value of money is entirely dependent on a future of need. Imagine for a moment that you knew somehow that everything you could ever need would be provided to you, that you would never need anything ever again. What value would money then have for you? When we acquire money then, we are not only acquiring value, we are also acquiring need, since the one cannot exist without the other. And that brings us to the second reason I've taken us on this exploration of money. See, the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus turns all of this on its head. Jesus, in this familiar miracle, encounters need. A huge crowd, 5,000 people are hungry. They have a need. And the disciples can only see the need. They suggest that Jesus send them away to a marketplace where they can exchange their money, that is, someone else's future need, for food to satisfy their current need. But Jesus interrupts this cycle of need. He says they don't need to go to the marketplace. And he doesn't interrupt it by giving them more money, giving them more need, but by asking, what do we have right here, right now? Let's share that and it will be enough. And he's right. Not only was it enough, it was more than enough. By circumventing the marketplace, by going around the bartering of need, Jesus showed the disciples how God's abundance works. You see, everything of value that money symbolically represents, whether it is food or drink or labor, all of those things are constantly being poured out by God for our enjoyment. We have food because plants and animals grow. Do we make them grow? No. We may labor to make their growth easier, but the growth comes from God. And that laboring, that is only possible because we are alive, because we exist. A fact which is itself a gift from God, part of God's abundance the things of value in this world that we have symbolically represented with our money so that we can hoard it, those things are in fact all part of an overflowing abundance that God pours out upon us every moment. It is that truth that Jesus reminds his followers of in this miracle. Now, one way to explain what happened that day is to say Jesus miraculously multiplied the bread and fish 
until it became enough. And that is certainly a powerful idea and perfectly represents what God does every day in causing life to exist and to grow and to flourish. I quite like a different explanation, though, that I heard a few years ago. The idea is this, that in fact, everyone who had followed Jesus out into the desert had brought enough food for himself or herself, and even a little extra. But when they all looked around and saw only need, only hunger, they hid their food. They hoarded it, thinking, there are so many, and I only have enough for me. I cannot possibly share. That's the way we see the world when we get wrapped up in this economy of money, this economy of need. But Jesus said, what do we actually have? He opened their eyes to a different reality. He got them to think not about their future need, but about what they had right now. And those loaves and fishes, he said, this is enough. And in breaking that bread and sharing it, he opened the hearts of everyone who was gathered there. And they all saw, if he can share, we can share too. And so they all began to contribute the little that they had brought. And in the end, it was more than enough for everyone to eat and to be satisfied. What Jesus does miraculously is open our eyes to a reality in which there is enough if we'll only share. There is enough because God pours out enough and more than enough every moment if we will only stop caring about our future need and focus on sharing what we have now, it is enough. Amen. Please join me as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern 
and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us your grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with anyone you may be gathered with in person, uh, your family at home, if you have folks at home, uh, to share a sign of peace with them. And then also to uh, type peace into the comment function if you're watching through YouTube or Facebook, um, to go ahead and uh, let us know that you are here and pass that piece so everyone can see virtually, if not in person, how many folks were here gathered and sharing the peace of Christ with each other. In just a moment, I'll put up a slide uh, with some information about how to uh, make an offering to St. Andrews. If you don't know how to do that and feel so inclined, I do want to stress that uh, I know these are difficult times for folks. And so if this is uh, a difficult time for you to make an offering, please do not feel that that is expected or required by any means. Um, in fact, if it is a difficult time for you, I hope you'll reach out to us here at St. Andrews and let us know how we can help. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please join me in this prayer of spiritual communion. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful of your church at every altar where your blessed body and blood are offered, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. And now in the words our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join me in this prayer too. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness. And in the power of your gracious might, rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. May the Spirit of truth lead you into all truth, giving you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and to proclaim the wonderful works of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.